My name is Nicholas Vern, and as your ANMS president, I'd like to welcome you to this evening's ANMS virtual symposia. Before we get started, I'd like to remind you of our upcoming meeting next week, the ANMS clinical meeting, July 26th to the 28th in Baltimore, Maryland. We hope to see everybody there. So this evening, our ANMS virtual symposia is entitled Mechanisms of the Cholinergic Anti-Inflammatory Pathway. Our moderators this evening will be Kirsten Browning and Dr. Rian Stavely. Dr. Browning received her degree from pharmacology at the University of Glasgow in Scotland, and currently she is professor in the Department of Neural and Behavioral Sciences at Penn State College of Medicine in Hershey, Pennsylvania. Her research interests include the physiology and pathophysiology of brain-gut interactions. Dr. Savely is currently at Mass General Hospital at Harvard Medical School. And his research interests include enteric neuroimmune interactions and postnatal stem cell biology, including their interactions for intestinal disorders. His current research focuses on the role of the ENS in regulating the severity of intestinal inflammation and identifying novel sources of adult neural stem cells. So with that, I'll turn this evening's program over to Dr. Browning, Dr. Stelvey. Thank you. Hello and welcome everyone to the session, Mechanisms of the Cholinergic Anti-Inflammatory Pathway. Um, I'm very excited for this session and we have two fantastic speakers today, Dr. Eric Chang and Patrice Skyane. Um, before we get started, though, I'd like to just take the opportunity to remind you that questions will be fielded by myself and Christine at the end of the talks, and please put your questions in the Q&A box below and not the general chat. So our first speaker, um, Eric, Dr. Eric Chang, is an Associate Professor at the Institute of Bioelectronic Medicine at the Feinstein Institutes for Medical Research and at Northwell Health in New York. He is a neuroscientist by training and works in a cross-disciplinary manner in the fields of neuroimmunology, bioengineering, and systems biology. Um, Dr. Chang's primary research focuses on neurochemical and electrophysiological com communication between the body and the brain, particularly through the vagus nerve. Um, his works includes studying how neural signals encode physiological and immune responses with potential applications for treating chronic inflammatory conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis and inflammatory bowel disease. Um, so thank you very much for joining us, um, Dr. Eric Chang, and we're very much looking forward to your talk. All right. Th thank you so much for the introduction, Rian, and uh, thank you to the Society for the invitation. Let me share. Okay. Uh, again, thank you. thanks for the introduction, and uh, today I'm going to uh, talk about specific neuroimmune circuits uh, that regulate uh, and control inflammation. Uh, the reason why we think that's important is because if you think about uh, what are the diseases, uh, in the human diseases that involve inflammation in the body? It really runs the gamut, um, you know, including uh, several types of cancer, cardiovascular disease, uh, of course, specific autoimmune diseases and neurodegenerative diseases. And if you look at the bottom of this slide uh, from this review article, you can see the significant uh, contributors to inflammation include uh, cytokine and chemokine dysregulation, um, an imbalance or sometimes called a dyshomeostasis between pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory mediators uh, such as cytokines. So uh, a lot of our research in our lab is uh, focused around uh, how can we leverage this understanding of neuroimmune circuits uh, to regulate uh, inflammation. And so I'm going to talk um, mostly about the vagus nerve mediated inflammatory reflex which is a, a, re, a neuroimmune circuit that was discovered uh, in Dr. Kevin Tracy's lab uh, at the Feinstein Institutes, uh, you know, 24 years ago, they published the work. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about that, but um, subsequently in the subsequent decades since that original paper, um, uh, Dr. Tracy's lab and, and others have, have shown that um, acetylcholine, uh, which I'll talk more about, is an important part of multiple components of this uh, anti-inflammatory circuit. And uh, cholinergic neurons in a more recent paper that we published um, it, in the brainstem uh, dorsal motor nucleus are the origin of the, the cholinergic uh, pathway that eventually reaches down to the spleen to change cytokines. So um, this audience is probably pretty familiar with the vagus nerve, but in case you're not, it's um, cranial nerve 10. You can see in this picture on the left that it uh, descends bilaterally from the brainstem. It's the longest cranial nerve in the body, innervating all of our major viscera, 
Vegas is Latin for wandering. As you see, it doesn't just tick, go down in a straight line. Um, it's part of the autonomic nervous system. It controls many vital functions uh, that I'm not going to mostly talk about, but uh, many other labs around the world study. Uh, I'm going to mostly focus uh, today on inflammation. And uh, interestingly, most of the nerve is not cholinergic. It's actually glutamatergic. And a majority of the fibers, uh, up to 90% or, so, or more, uh, are actually sensory afferents that send signals from the body uh, up to the brain. So... Um, some of you, um, like the many of you, have probably heard of vagus nerve stimulation, uh, which is, uh, or VNS, which is in the US FDA approved therapy for treating uh, medication refractory epilepsy, uh, as well as medication refractory depression, and a few years ago approved for uh, motor recovery uh, following stroke. And uh, possibly in the next year or so, uh, very soon, uh, VNS may be approved as a treatment for chronic inflammatory disorders, including uh, first rheumatoid arthritis and potentially other uh, diseases of the gut, such as inflammatory bowel disease. So let me return to that the original paper on the inflammatory reflex. Um, and this is a first, so, you know, 24 years later now, um, this uh, treatment's reaching the clinic and patients. Um, but in the first study, it was actually done in rats in a model of endotoxemia. So what um, Dr. Tracy's lab did in this is uh, use LPS, lipopolysaccharide, which is a bacterial endotoxin. If you inject that into the body of rats, um, levels of um, TNF, which is tumor necrosis factor, one of these pro-inflammatory cytokines increases. Uh, if you perform a vagotomy, which is what VGX is, uh, you, it's kind of like releasing the brakes and you actually get even more inflammation. However, if you perform vagotomy but stimulate with electricity the ends connected down to the body, you get this dramatic reduction in um, TNF levels uh, and you get an improval, re reduction of lethality and improval of survival. And so that work um, and other work from, from our lab as well as others, including the next speaker, Dr. Gunier's lab, um, have identified that this inflammatory reflex and the anti-inflammatory action of stimulating the vagus nerve at the cervical level uh, can reduce inflammation in a variety of disease contexts. And I'll just uh, go over this last, uh, more recent paper uh, from our lab, uh, which was published in 2020. And this work was led, uh, led by Adam Kressel, who was a surgeon getting his PhD in the lab. And what uh, Adam did in this paper is use a combination of viral tracers to kind of map the, the anatomical circuitry of this pathway. So he uh, first injected AAV, adenovirus, into the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus nerve, the uh, nucleus in the brainstem. Uh, that sent, uh, you know, tracing down to the celiac ganglion. And then he used a retrograde tra tracer, HSV1, herpes simplex 1, with the m cherry tag, uh, with injections into the spleen, and uh, to trace, uh, you know, the connections that are actually noradrenergic into the celiac ganglion. So if you look in the brainstem, you can see CHAT, which are the cholinergic neurons, um, the, some of these experiments involve chat, uh, channel rhodopsin with YFP, which uh, it's an optogenetic uh, opsin. Um, and then uh, you can see now these are images from the celiac ganglion complex. And I'll just, you know, this is published, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it. But uh, in the panel N, these M cherry labeled neurons are actually from the retrograde injection into the spleen. Uh, and then uh, what he did was um, use optogenetics, which is using light. Uh, and ch with channel rhodopsin, which is the blue light sensitive opsin, allows you to activate, uh, in this case, cholinergic neurons in these mice. And uh, what Adam did was put a fiber optic cannula into the dorsal motor nucleus. And uh, when he did that, at, at two, and then used LPS injection, just like the original paper, uh, when you do yellow light, when he did yellow light, which doesn't activate channel rhodopsin, uh, you don't get any reduction in TNF. Uh, however, when he used blue light, which does activate the channel rhodops, and you get this dramatic reduction in TNF, um, just like we saw with the in the rat endotoxemia model. Uh, and then because Adam was a surgeon and a bit of a masochist, he said, what if we um, try to record from the splenic nerve of a mouse, uh, which is very challenging because it's a very small nerve and it's you know buried in a bunch of things. But uh, he did it. Um, and so he put a nerve cuff electrode on the splenic nerve when, and then a fiber optic cannula into the brainstem. And when he turned on light in litter bank controls without channel rhodopsin, nothing really changes on electrical activity of the nerve. However, in chat channel rhodopsin animals, you turn on blue light in the brainstem, 
and he got a dramatic increase uh, while light was on. So this kind of showed uh, the connection, the, the anatomical connections, as well as a functional connection between the brainstem, DMN, uh, celiac ganglia, and the spleen. So this pathway, uh, that work, in addition to uh, several other papers from the lab and other labs, um, uh, kind of delineate the cholinergic anti-inflammatory pathway, which again, originates in the brainstem. You can, uh, at the cervical level, stimulate uh, electrically or optogenetically um, to get to those uh, that pathway um, that activates uh, neurons in the celiac ganglion, which then uh, release norepinephrine in the spleen, um, activating um, chat positive T cells that then release acetylcholine and then uh, activate um, act on macrophages that then reduce levels of TNF and other pro-inflammatory cytokines. So um, knowing this circuit, this molecular circuit and this neural circuit, uh, one question became, can we use this understanding and knowing that the vagus nerve uh, innervates the major viscera, can we use this knowledge to treat uh, inflammation in the body? So uh, this was a collaboration between uh, Dr. Tracy's lab and, and a group in Amsterdam and looking at rheumatoid arthritis patients. And it's a small study, only 17 patients, but um, seven of them failed methotrexate, which is a first line drug. Um, and, and 10 of them failed biologics such as um, uh, monoclonal antibodies. So uh, these are patients, um, they measure the DAS-28, which is clinical scale. Um, at this dotted line, they're implanted with the vagus nerve implant on the left vagus nerve at the cervical level. And then uh, in this scale, when the scores go down, the symptoms improve. Uh, and the study design was that the implant was turned off for two weeks. So you can see there's a, so there's improvement in symptoms. Um, and then when the simulator is off, there's actually a bit of a rebound and then an improvement again. Again, a small study, but then this was replicated in another pilot study uh, performed in France, uh, published in Lan Lancet Rheumatology. Then based on this uh, pre uh, clinical work in humans, as well as a, a large body of preclinical work, um, a company in California called Setpoint Medical uh, has been running a clinical trial for rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, they actually closed a phase three trial with uh, phase three uh, of the trial with 242 patients at 41 sites in the US, double blind, sham controlled. Uh, and actually just last week, um, so if you look, this is hot off the press. It's not really press because it's just a website. But um, you know, a week ago today, on July 10th, Setpoint Medical uh, announced these positive top line results for this Reset RA study. And uh, this system, this implant, is the first neuroimmune modulation device to demonstrate clinical benefit in adults living with moderate to severe rheumatoid arthritis. So uh, you know, I think this is this is pretty exciting because if you come back to the my first slide. You know, we think of disorders of chronic inflammation, obviously ones that are primarily driven by inflammation are uh, ones these audiences are probably familiar with, um, inflammatory bowel diseases, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, plaque psoriasis, and many other disorders uh, that involve inflammation. You know, in medicine, our current toolbox involves, you know, uh, NSAIDs, corticosteroids, methotrexate, a new regeneration of uh, quote-unquote biologics, which... You know, in the U.S., we see commercials direct to consumer on all the time, Humira, which is a monoclonal antibody against TNF, uh, Skyrizi, people look very happy in these commercials. Uh, it's also a monoclonal antibody against TNF. Dupixent is a, a monoclonal antibody against a different cytokine receptor. But, you know, these are all kind of working the same way, which is to reduce levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines. Uh, but we, you know, and, but, you know, these drugs, because they're monoclonal antibodies, have to be given IV. Um, for the most part, uh, they're very expensive and they do have side effects. And more importantly, they don't necessarily work in all the patients, right? So there are some patients that don't respond to either traditional or biologics. And this, uh, so for these patients, there's an alternative, uh, we think, uh, which is this bioelectronic medicine approach, which is a new paradigm to treat inflammation. And so uh, our lab is part of the Institute of Bioelectronic Medicine, uh, medicine and so our lab and others here at Feinstein, uh, you know, work to identify molecular targets and then understand the neural signals that control that target or that disease process or that physiology, then work either with in-house engineers and material scientists or, or collaborate outside to make devices that then can interface with the nerve, whether it's the vagus nerve or a sciatic nerve or another nerve uh, at an end organ. The idea is that we can then modulate uh, the disease process with electricity or light or some other type of neuromodulation approach. And 
you know, this doesn't necessarily need to replace uh, pharmaceuticals. It can be used um, in joint, you know, as an adjunct of therapy with existing medications. The, you know, the main goal is that the patients get a response and improves their disease outcome. So, you know, this is, like I said, uh, close to actually happening, uh, becoming a reality for rheumatoid arthritis. And there's other data, both preclinical and clinical, on inflammatory bowel disease and um, other disorders that, again, involve inflammation. So, um, so you know, we're very excited. Uh, we and others are very excited about this possibility, and I think um, hopefully we'll hear more about that in the news soon. Um, the uh, but uh, a lot of the recent work in the lab has actually looked at what's happening. Uh, so I kind of delineated the cholinergic anti-inflammatory descending pathway, but as we all know, reflex arcs uh, have both the sensory afferent component uh, and a motor efferent component. Um, so, you know, if you get, you know, a pinprick on the skin, the signals go up, um, you know, sensory afferents via dorsal root ganglia, then there's a few synapses to get to the motor uh, neuron that then causes you to withdraw. So that's a, you know, canonical reflex arc. Similarly, in the inflammatory reflex, there's a, the motor efferent arc, which is what I've focused on so far. But what I want to tell you about for the rest of the talk is some work we've been doing on the sensory afferent arc, which is um, how, how does the um, inf information about inflammation in the body uh, become detected by sensory neurons and potentially encoded in electrical activity sent to the brain? Um, so uh, I essentially said this, how is inflammation sent by the peripheral nervous system? And we know that when there's injury leading or infection leading to inflammation, that uh, cytokines are released. Um, if you, you know, and a uh, vagal afferents are innervating each of these different sites um, and potentially picking up on that cytokine release, uh, the cell bodies of these sensory afferents reside, are resided, uh, reside in the nodose ganglion, uh, which is at the base of the skull at the top of the neck in both mice and humans. So we develop a technique to image these, uh, this ganglia in VGLU2 GCAMP6 mice. So um, the sensory afferents are glutamatergic, as I mentioned in the beginning. And then, so we have this calcium indicator so that when the neurons are active, uh, we can see a change in fluorescence. So we use something called a miniature microscope or a miniscope uh, to image the nodos while we're applying different agonists onto the vagus nerve. Um, and then, so this is a picture of what it looks like, a uh, mouse under anesthesia, a miniscope targeting the nodos. And then this is what it, uh, this is kind of like what our raw data looks like. Um, and this, so you, you'll see, you know, different neurons lighting up because they're becoming activated by capsaicin, which is uh, what makes chili peppers hot, which is why I put in red. Um, and, uh, you know, you can see it activates many neurons in the nodos. Um, and this is, this paper that we published last year was, was more of a, around the methodology of using this approach. You know, we develop a set of Python-based tools to extract the uh, spatial components, which are the neurons. And then, you know, uh, remove artifacts, selectivity filters. Um, that's, and then we put the code on GitHub if anyone's interested. Um, and then, so, but what we really wanted to do with this approach was to answer the question, are there cytokine-specific neural responses uh, in the nodose ganglion? So again, we're imaging the nodos while applying cytokines uh, now. In this case, cytokines, this is TNF. And you can see uh, immediately that the responses uh, there's not as many neurons that are activated compared to capsaicin. Uh, and then when we look at other cytokines, for example, interleukin-1 beta is another canonical pro-inflammatory cytokine. Uh, even comparing TNF to IL-1, the responses are very different at the single neuron level. So the, the IL-1 responses are a little lower in amplitude uh, as far as calcium transients and a little kind of burstier. Um, so, you know, I, you know, this is the first, we think, demonstration that... Um, individual cytokines have distinct uh, neural activity signatures at the, in the periphery. So uh, we also have immunohistochemistry data. This is uh, work that's not yet published, but um, you know, we know that the dodos neurons have TNF receptor, IL-1, uh, IL-10, which is a canonical anti-inflammatory cytokine. Um, each, as you can see here, each of the different classes of cytokines have distinct neural signatures, which um, you know, could have important uh, meaning for the coding of these immune signals as that information goes to the brain. Uh, and then we kind of took these calcium transients and, and took the peak, uh, you know, did an amplitude threshold and tried to convert it into a raster plot, kind of like spikes in a traditional electrophysiology. 
Um, but these are calcium transients, so there's a caveat there. But uh, you can see in these combination experiments where IL-1 and TNF are applied, that uh, there's a set of neurons that respond preferentially to IL-1, but not TNF. Another group that just seems to respond to TNF. Uh, a, a third group that responds to both. And then many of the neurons that I'm not showing you here are actually in this fourth class, which don't care about either. Um, because they probably don't have the cytokine receptors for those, um, and they respond to other things that are mediating other things such as breathing or heart rate. Um, but, you know, so, you know, this work is, uh, we're wrapping it up, but, you know, I think it's important and it shows that there's a level of encoding of immune signals in the periphery even before we get into the brain. Um, so working in the periphery um, is has its own challenges, of course, because uh, the body is very mushy and flexible. And, you know, so, you know, we, we have to work with, you know, engineers and material scientists and, and collaborate across disciplines and fields to really understand and make devices that can interface with a part of the gut or the vagus nerve of a mouse, which is less than a hundred microns in diameter. Um, and, uh, you know, design devices to record and modulate um, different nerves. And so, you know, from the neuroscience toolbox, we have a lot of tools, uh, you know, electrical stimulation is, you know, been around forever. Uh, there are many studies from uh, all over about electrically stimulating with nerve cuff electrodes on the vagus nerve and other nerves. Um, we and other labs use optogenetic as well as chemogenetic modulation. So this is just a, a, a snapshot of papers from our lab and other labs at Feinstein. And more recently, uh, our labs have been doing acoustic modulation with focus ultrasound. Um, so this is a new uh, approach to to use uh, non-invasively activate either a nerve or a set of uh, a nerve plexus or a set of neurons non-invasively with focus ultrasound. So you know the overall goal is that to understand these specific neural circuits that mediate disease physiology. Uh, once we have that understanding, hopefully we can design strategies and devices uh, to to modulate those circuits and and subsequently treat disease without uh, drugs. Uh, or in combination with drugs. So um, I think this is my last slide, but the vagus, so I hope I've showed you that the vagus nerve is a, a very important conduit, obviously between the brain and the body, uh, the gut and the brain and the nervous system and the immune system. And um, as I mentioned uh, later in the talk, we're very interested in understanding how when immune cells uh, release mediators, such as cytokines, but also chemokines and DAMPs and PAMPs, uh, how do they activate sensory neurons convert and transduce that stimulus into an electrical activity, which we know is the language of the nervous system, send that up vagal afferents or, or, or DRG afferents, you know, which carries somatosensory information to the brain. And then once it gets to the brain, is there a kind of an immune homunculus uh, or a mapping of those different types of immune mediators within the brain? Um, because if there is, uh, and we have some, again, unpub unpublished evidence that it is, um, but uh, work from other labs has shown that there are um, parts of the brain, particularly the cortex, that encode different immune events. Um, then if we can identify and map those out, then we can start to target them with uh, neuromodulation techniques, non-invasive or invasive, to treat inflammation. And I think um, you know, a lot of people are starting to talk about inflammatory disorders, actually nervous system disorders. So we're very excited about that possibility. Um, and the possibility to use some of the tools we have uh, as a neuroscientist to treat these disorders. Uh, so I think that's 20 minutes, hopefully, on time. Um, I just want to thank um, the people I work with at the Feinstein. I work very closely with Dr. Tracy and other faculty members here on the top left. Uh, I highlighted work from Tomas Huerta, who was a postdoc in the lab. And uh, this is the rest of the lab group. And I want to acknowledge our funding sources. And uh, thank you again for the invitation and uh, for listening. Thank you. So it's my great pleasure to introduce our second speaker. So Dr. Patrice Guillenet is a professor in the Department of Pharmacology at the University of Virginia with expertise in integrative neuroscience, particularly how the brain processes specific information types. Um, including how the lower brainstem networks regulate processes such as breathing, how they regulate blood pressure and circulation, how central chemoreceptors function to maintain homeostasis, as well as the outflow of the sympathetic nervous system. Lately, and in collaboration with Marco Cusa, he has examined how acute stress 
and vagal sensory afferent stimulation can protect the kidneys from ischemic in from, um, injury. So the proposed mechanism relies on a vagal afferent sympathetic efferent reflex. So it gives me great pressure to introduce Dr. Guyane and his talk entitled Renal Protective Anti-Inflammatory Reflex Elicited in Mice by Acute Stress or Vagal Afferent Stimulation is Mediated by C1 Cells, the Sympathetic Nervous System and the Spleen. Dr. Guyane. Okay, very good. So uh, this is the title page we can skip. I would like to first acknowledge my collaborators and uh, particularly in my in my lab or my ex lab since I just retired and uh, my uh, uh, colleagues in nephrology, particularly Dr. Okusa. So you learn, you'll hear a lot about a renal ischemic renal injury. And uh, that is uh, uh, because of my collaboration with nephrology. So we've just heard about the canonical vagal vagal inflammatory reflex and the splenic CAP uh, co uh, conceived as, as, a, as a feedback regulation whereby the presence of pro-inflammatory cytokines are sensed by the vagus nerve and through a circuit that's not completely understood, activate vagal efferent. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, that somehow uh, reduce the production by macrophage, by spleen macrophages or inflammat of inflammatory factors. So this represents a feedback loop. The vagal uh, efferent reaches the spleen uh, through the celiac ganglia, as you've heard, Although there is question mark, this has not been universally found. And also through the peritoneal and the apex of the spleen, as suggested by a paper by Komori et al. in 2023. So my point is here to uh, understand, to present you uh, how this uh, cholinergic anti-inflammatory pathway uh, is uh, regulated through the sympathetic pathway. And uh, this is an alternative pathway, which we think is triggered by stress as part of the fight and flight response, but more oddly is actually triggered when you stimulate the vagus nerve. Now, remember that electrical stimulation of a nerve is not specific. You simultaneously activate fibers of all types and this mode of stimulation or the bulk stimulation of afferents using, uh, uh, using optogenetics, we found, in fact, uh, produce the activation of, this, of the cholinergic uh, anti-inflammatory pathway through the C1 cells and the sympathetic system. So what are the C1 neurons? For those who have never heard of those, these are glutamatergic and adrenergic cells located in the ventral lateral medulla. They would be around 800 in a mouse. And their, their best, better known feature is that they innervate directly the intermediolateral cell column and essentially drive the sympathetic system. Less publicized is that they also, they also innovate every single region of the brain that's involved in the regulation of autonomic function. They also make a beeline to every single group of noradrenergic neurons in the brain indicated in red, which means that since the sympathetic nervous system is also a noradrenergic, activation of the C1 neurons produce a release of norepinephrine in, in both the brain and the entire body through the sympathetic nervous system. So our model is the renal injury ischemic, in, 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 ischemic reperfusion injury in mass. So the mass is anesthetized, retroperitoneal surgeries is uh, performed, artery and veins are clamped for a, a fixed times, and renal damage is assessed 24 hours later based on the functional criteria of plasma creatinine, a gene expression of Kim, 
which is kidney injury molecule that goes up tremendously with, with the ischemic damage. And finally, the histology is also uh, taken into consideration. So uh, rest, the first part I'll talk about restraint stress. Restraint stress in this protocol is merely putting the mice in a transparent tube for 10 minutes, that's all. And as you, if you measure blood pressure and heart rate, you can see a relatively modest increase in blood pressure, but a tremendous tachycardia, which reflects the sympathetic activation. So what I would like to show you is that this activates the spleen uh, cholinergic anti-inflammatory pathway through the C1 cells and the sympathetic nervous system, not through the vagal efferent pathway. So the phenomenology, uh, restraint stress, 10 minutes, renal ischemia perfusion a day after. And then the, the next day, the blood is sampled and the histology performed. As, as you can see here, uh, the, this uh, restraint stress uh, uh, low, uh, results in a much lower level of plasma creatinine, which means that the kidney have been protected. The level of expression of this kidney injury molecule is considerably reduced, also evidence of protection. And uh, from a histological standpoint, the tubular necrosis that can be quantified uh, histologically is also reduced. So how does that come about? Uh, this lists the evidence that the restraint stress protects the kidney by activating the C1 neurons and the, C and the sympathetic nervous system in gray alternate routes that might be considered, which is one through the DMV and the parasympathetic nervous system. The other would be via corticosterone release. So evidence of the C1 sympathetic pathways as follows. Stimulating optogenetically C1 neuron mimics the protective effect of restraint stress. C1 neurons increase sympathetic nerve activity that's been known for a long time. C1 neurons selectively eliminate the protective effect of stress. C1 neuron inhibition, even the temporary inhibition of the cell using the DREAD technology, starting just before the stress, eliminates the protective effect of stress. The C1 neurons are glutamatergic and aminergic neurons. We think glutamate is the key transmitter because deleting VGLUT2, the vesicular transporter that necessary for the release of, v of glutamate, selectively from DBH positive neurons, eliminate the protective effect of C1 cell stimulation. Bilateral subdiaphragmatic vagotomy does not attenuate the protection. Therefore, the, the efferent route doesn't seem to be through the vagus nerve. Hemicholinium, a ganglionic blocker that block transmission between preganglionic and ganglionic neuron, reduce the protection. And the, we don't think that corticosterone, which is released by stress, is involved in that particular endpoint of renal injury protection because pretreatment with mefipristone does not prevent the protection. So this series of experiments suggest that the renal protect, the protection of the, the kidney requires the C1 cell and is mediated by the sympathetic nervous system. Is it mediated through the cholinergic anti-inflammatory pathway? We think so because of the following evidence. The protective effect of stress on renal injury is eliminated by splenectomy, removing the spleen. The protective effect of stress is absent in uh, alpha-7 nicotinic receptor knockout mice. The alpha-7 nicotinic receptor is involved in the transmission between the cholinergic T lymphocyte and the macrophages. Furthermore, the beta-2 adrenergic antagonist butoxamine, which we, uh, we assume work here, attenuates the protective effect of stress. And finally, 
injection of CD4 T lymphocytes exposed to norepinephrine in vitro and is protective. I, I, that is, reproduces the effect of stress. The second, so uh, the second uh, part of uh, the data I would like to show you is the, is more more counterintuitive if you if you want because it shows that vagal nerve afferent stimulation, either electrical or optogenetic, also activates the spleen CAP via the C1 neurons and SNS pathway. In other words, it's not activating through a quick uh, vagal, vagal reflex. So the first observation that led us <clears throat> in this direction was the odd observation that if we stimulate the, the vagus nerve, the whole vagus nerve, or the uh, afferent, or the efferent, we obtain the same protection against ischemic renal injury, as shown here by the reduction in plasma creatinine and the relative expression of this uh, kidney injury molecule one. So evidence, uh, uh, this summarized the evidence that stimulating the vagal afferent works, at least in our model, through the C1 cells and sympathetic nervous system. If we stimulate the vagus nerve, we know that this activated the C1 cells. We know that, we've, we've known that since the 80s, actually, uh, that act electrical stimulation of the vagal afferent will direct activate those cells. It, in mice, if you stimulate the vagus nerve, you express FOS in the C1 cells, which is an indication of activation. We know that uh, also vagus afferent stimulation activates the sympathetic nerve everywhere, splanchnics, not just splenic, but splanchnic and uh, lumbar, in rats and mice. Uh, we, we have showed also that optogenetic stimulation of C1 cell produce the anti-inflammatory effect, of course. And uh, C1 lesion, interestingly, eliminates the protective effect of stimulating the afferent, but it does not eliminate the protective effect of stimulating the vagal efferent. VNS stimulation electrically protects the kidney even after section of the subdiaphragmatic vagal nerve, which rules the vagal vagal reflex. Corticosterone is not involved for reason I expressed before. Adrenalectomy is ineffective, but butoxamine, the beta-2 adrenergic antagonist, suppress the protective effect. Hence, adrenaline release from the adrenal medulla is not critical, but the uh, adrenergic, noradrenergic transmission, presumably at the level of the T lymphocyte, is of essence. Finally, splenic denervation eliminated the protection elicited by uh, uh, by afferent stimulation, uh, vagal afferent stimulation, but renal denervation as a control had no effect. So uh, the following evidence indicates that uh, the uh, cholinergic anti-inflammatory pathway is involved, and uh, this, the arguments are are the same as for the uh, uh, the part the the uh, uh, restraint stress. Splenectomy eliminates the protective effect of afferent stimulation. The protective effect of afferent stimulation is absent in alpha-7 nicotinic receptor knockout mass. Adoptive transfer, that is infusion of splenocyte harvested from mice exposed to, to uh, stimulation of the afferent or the efferent, by the way, protects unstimulated mice from ischemic reperfusion injury. The beta-2 adrenergic antagonist butoxamine uh, attenuates the protective effect of stress. And uh, in injection of uh, CD4 
for T lymphocyte previously exposed to norepinephrine in vitro is protected. Finally, adoptive transfer of lymph node uh, cells or bone marrow did not confer the protection. So this type of evidence suggests that the effect of vagal nerve stimulation, afferent stimulation, is caused by the activation of the cholinergic anti-inflammatory pathway. So conclusion, the splenic cholinergic anti-inflammatory pathway can be activated by both parasympathetic, that is vagal uh, efferent, uh, and by the sympathetic system via the C1 cells. These efferents are, I question mark, largely anatomically separate, largely is maybe uh, not warranted since we've heard Dr. Chang provide very assertive evidence of this connection. Uh, the second conclusion is during restrained stress, activation of the splenic CAP occurs via the sympathetic route. The, P, the parasympathetic vagal route is at least dispensable. The conclusion three, which is the, perhaps the most counterintuitive, is that stimulation of either afferent vagus, vag, uh, of the vagal, vagus nerve sensory afferent or cholinergic efferent activate the cholinergic anti-inflammatory pathway. But electrical and optogenetic uh, vagal nerve afferent stimulation recruits the CAP by the sympathetic route. So why is that? This, uh, this is counterintuitive. Why does why is the stimulating the stimulation, sorry, of vagal afferent activate the CAP via the sympathetic route and not via the vagal route? One possible explanation is the can canonical vagal-vagal anti-inflammatory reflex is triggered only by a small subset of cytokine responsive afferents, which have been hypothesized to be uh, synthesizing uh, the, the gene CALCA or TRIPA1. Dr. Chang has showed you that a, a subset of these cells only res respond. By, the, by contrast, the wholesale electrical stimulation of the, of the vagal afferent is a very different beast because it co-activates uh, a number of fibers in a manner that's non-physiological. And this mode of stimulation uh, seemed to uh, recruit the, the CAP via the sympathetic outflow. So what's the big picture here? I would I would propose that uh, activation of the anti-inflammatory pathway of the spleen via the C1's SNS pathway is just a component, one more component of a global response to physical and psychological stress. Psychological stress is a threat, which is the anticipation of injury. The, all these factors will activate the C1 cells and what the C1 cells do, they release norepinephrine in the brain to produce increased vigilance, arousal, and attention. They activate the paraventricular uh, magnocellular nucleus, which promotes water retention in case, in case of injury. They release corticosterone, they activate the sympathetic nervous system to the cardiovascular system and will produce increased vasoconstriction if need be. They, re, they, they increase breathing. And we think, based on what I presented to you, they also activate the cholinergic anti-inflammatory uh, pathway for the purpose of injury pro uh, protection. So we think that all these effects are produced by stimulating the vagal afferent 
in an unphysiological sense uh, way, which is electrical or bulk optogenetic. So what are the implications for bioelectronics and the way electrical nerve stimulation elicits its anti-inflammatory effect? This is an opinion, basically, of mine. Uh, judging from the reported anti-inflammatory efficacy of electroacupuncture, auricular nerve stimulation, a broad range of sensory afferents other than autonomic may also be able to activate the CAP, possibly via the, the C1 sympathetic nerve route. Why would that be? My interpretation is that unphysiological volleys of sensory afferent activity, such as those elicited by nerve stimulation, either electrically or optogenetically, will reach the lower brainstem reticular core and activate the C1 cells. The type of sensory afferent that is stimulated may not be critical. And we are going back here to work uh, performed on the reticular formation performed from the 60s to the 70s, where uh, neurophysiologists have showed the extreme degree of convergence of responses evoked by stimulating somatosensory or autonomic afferents. So I leave it there uh, with this thought that uh, the CAP can be activating in a non-selective manner by the artificial uh, uh, activation of sensory afferent uh, of a broad category of sensory afferent. And this might explain the uh, uh, anti-inflammatory effect, not only of vagal nerve stimulation, but perhaps of electroacupuncture, auricular nerve stimulation, etc. Thank you for your attention and for the invitation. Um, thank you very much. So while others are putting their questions into the chat, I'd like to ask the first question to um, Dr. Guyane. So one of the questions is, the, um, mm. so you, you showed that the protective effect of restraint stress on ischemic reperfusion injury was seen with acute stress. Is it also seen with chronic stress or does the chronification um, effect abolish that? Uh, we haven't gone that way. I think I would, I, I very much doubt it. The chronic effect of chronic stress are completely different. I, 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 I view this effect of acute stress in the context of a, a response, uh, one of the response associated with fight and flight, mm -hmm. basically the Walter Cannon, uh, effect, okay, Where, so, whereby the CAP activation is one more of all these responses in res uh, these responses to an acute danger. So one kind of follow up question to that is, um, so the type of stress you used was restraint stress, which, yes. and you made the point that it's a psychological stress. Would physical stress have the same effect? I don't know. Okay. I would. Uh, I this this would have to be studied. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I actually have a question for um Dr. Chang. Um, you, the talk was fantastic, and it's really highlighted, you know, like like a future of translating this these technologies. Um, so as highlighted by Dr. Gane, um, there is sort of electrical stimulation can be like a, a bit dirty stimulating like lots of different nerve fiber types efferents efferents um is it possible that the tools that we're using to understand the physiology in mice such as optogenetics and using aab viruses could be utilized clinically to stimulate certain um, neuronal types or nerve fiber subtypes or would that be a, a pipe dream uh yeah i mean yes uh, first i just want to say congratulations to dr gunier on the retirement <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's a sad story. <laughs> um, and and yes, um, and I, so I get this question a lot, uh, which is like, you know, when are you going to put optogenic viruses into a person? Uh, first, first answer is that it's already been done, you know, to treat a form of, of blindness uh, to put options into people's retinas. Uh, but but more importantly, I think when we use optogenetics or chemogenetics or some of these mouse-specific tools, genetic tools. 
Um, what we're doing is is trying to identify a molecular target, you know, so we know, let's say it's, you know, trip A1 channels that mediate this process, then it becomes, so if we demonstrate that in a mouse or a pig or a non-human primate, then it's a different problem to say, well, how are we going to get to those guys then, those trip A1 channels? You can use pharmacology then from there in a person or, or use some other tools, you know, where there's a lot of new tools, non-invasive, which tend to be less specific. Um, but, you know, in some of these cases, if you can access with a minimally invasive surgery, you know, like the vagus nerve implant is an outpatient procedure, you know, it's like an hour, two hours in a, you, you need a neurosurgeon to do it, but it's not, you know, a, a very difficult surgery. Uh, that being said, no one's going to, rather than taking a pill to treat something, no one's going to say like, cut them in my neck and give me an implant. But, you know, for people who have failed the other avenues and, or maybe the side effects are too severe, this becomes, um, you know, a, a viable option for treatment, I think. But I, I think optogenetics, for example, one example is, is a way to identify the basic uh, mechanisms in an animal model, in vivo model, model that then um, highlight a target that we can hit with maybe other things, not necessarily optogenetics or chemogenetics. Great, thanks. So could I ask a question actually for both of our um, speakers? So. Vagal nerve simulation is not without side effects. So in humans, there's reports of you know, cough or esophageal spasms or um, potentially gastric dysrhythmias, as well as decreases in blood pressure and heart rate. So is that going to limit the use or are the benefits outweighing the adverse effects? Uh, I mean, I'll answer that very quickly. I mean, the side effects are very uh, minor and in a very small percentage of patients. Uh, while, while in those patients that have them, and in, including when the stimulator is on, if someone's speaking, mm -hmm. typically their voice gets hoarse, you know, because it's also near the laryngeal nerves. Um, so obviously with any nerve stimulation, and particularly with an implant, there are potential side effects, but uh, the side effect profile is very uh, is very good for BNS implants. Um, that being said, there are certain patients that might experience side effects and maybe that's, you know, unfortunately not an option for them. Um, but on the whole, I would say um, it's been very good. Um, obviously electrical stim as, as Dr. Gounet pointed out is not as specific as we want, particularly, you know, we can get more specificity in animal models, but um, you know, there are other challenges to getting, you know, genetic specificity in a human, uh, and we're not quite there yet. So, Dr. Gounet, go ahead. Well, maybe the specificity is not critical. Uh, mm. if, if there is a grain of truth in what we found, <laughs> is that you basically have to find a bunch of, of sensory afferents that can work their way to the reticular formation without causing pain and you are in your home pre. And so, I mean, maybe that's what's done with the auricular branch, which some people consider an autonomic afferent. To me, it's just a, it, it's just a, somat a somatic inference that happened to travel to, uh, along with the vagus nerve uh, at some point. And uh, well, I'm, my understanding is that you stimulate until it really, up with inten and you up the intensity until it becomes bothersome. So you must be stimulating the most excitable fibers that may be myelinated sensory fibers, I would imagine. And uh, yeah, and the, the stimulation, the amount of current is, you know, typically below two milliamps or so. And, and the stimulation used to for VNS implants for uh, treating depression and epilepsy are different parameters for treating the chronic inflammation. So the for the uh, for for example, rheumatoid arthritis, the stimulation is uh, I believe once or twice a day for a minute. Whereas for epilepsy, the stimulators are on with a very heavy duty cycle basically all the time. So uh, so, you know, there there are several papers and groups to debate back and forth about the specific parameters, but what we know is that uh, the recruitment of the fibers that are important for reducing inflammation appeared, they're able to be recruited, uh, possibly because they're myelinated B fibers that are cholinergic um, with a low stimulation intensity. And, and if, as you turn the current up, 
you start to get more side effects because you start recruiting maybe unmyelinated, you know, nociceptor fibers and other things. Um, but, you know, if the patient has an implant and the doctor has a controller, then they can, you know, try to dose that accordingly for each individual patient. So in human, when you stimulate the vagus nerve and you get a beneficial effect, do you believe you stimulate the efferent or the afferent? Uh, I believe it's the efferent, which are myelinated B fibers that oh. are cholinergic descending from the brainstem. How do you know? That is yeah. a sensory reflex like we found in, the, in, in our little mice. Well, we don't know in, in the in the humans, um, but yes, you're right. I mean, but I, I guess it comes back to what, what your comment was, is that if, if the uh, symptoms decrease and the inflammation decreases, uh, I think for the patient, they, for us, we care because we want to know the circuit and the, the, the exact fibers. Uh, but I guess for the, the patient population, they want to know that it works. Yes. Um, and so, so far, you know, it's, it's early days, but it seems to work. Um, and there's also a number of, of preclinical and clinical studies in inflammatory bowel disease that suggest beneficial effects. Um, so, um, so the good thing is that it seems to work. And uh, I think we can try to figure out exactly how it's working, which is uh, obviously we're very interested in that. Um, so, yeah. So what do you think of electroacupuncture? I've seen papers that suggest that you also activate the anti-inflammatory pathway, which sort of, in my mind, goes in the same concept that uh, providing that you find uh, uh, afferent fibers that can reach the reticular formation and are not too painful, you are, uh, you are, you are actually recruiting the... Uh, you know, the anti-inflammatory response. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's very likely possible that um, it's there, there are, you know, this is not the, uh, the inflammatory reflex is not the only pathway to get towards an anti-inflammatory effect as um, your group and other groups have shown. There are uh, potentially multiple neuroimmune pathways that either converge on, you know, let's say C1 neurons or converge in the NTS to activate other different circuits um, there are a very recent nature paper showing that, you know, it's the, the calca uh, and, DBH, and DBH neurons in NTS that control different up or down, you know, inflammatory responses. Um, and I think what's exciting is that we're starting to figure out, you know, what are the genetic subsets? Um, comes back to Rian's question of then, uh, you know, how do we get to those in a person? But maybe we don't need to get to those in the person to get the beneficial effects, um, you know, if the side effect prof profile is becomes more negative, um, or you can improve the you know the the um, disease outcomes by getting more specificity, then it becomes worth it to try to understand that. But if you don't get that benefit in the the human case, then you know it's it's more of a basic science question, which interests many of us, but um, is maybe not as important for translation and and in the clinic. Okay, so I'm sorry I'm going to have to cut this short. We are just about run out of time, okay. um, sadly. Um, but what I can say is that all the kind of unanswered questions will be posted on the Doc Matters. The URL is on screen just now. So with that, um, I have to close this session. I would like to extend my th great thanks to our speakers, um, Drs. Chang and Guyane as well as the ANMS for hosting this late, latest webinar in their very successful series. Thank you all to the audience for tuning in and to their questions and interactions. And with that, um, have a good evening, everyone. Um, stay safe, take care of yourself and take care of each other. Good night, everyone.